Ah, folklore. Imagine sitting around a fire listening to fanciful tales of monsters and creatures battling through the night. Coined in 1846 by William Toms, the term folklore is defined as the informal communication of cultural concepts, such as customs, belief, and a shared identity. The point of folk tales is to pass down concepts and ideas relevant to the group listening to the story. In a sense, they're about tradition and never letting the story die out. But how did folk tales lead to our most iconic fantasy tropes over the past century? Is folklore the foundation of fantasy? A lot of the time, folk tales had a basis in real events. For example, monsters are some of the most commonly used elements in folklore. Take the werewolf, for example. In the 19th century, werewolves represented the battle of good and evil present in all of us, much like they do in modern storytelling but they were also based on a real-life documented event. In 18th century France, 113 people were killed by a giant wolf in the small town of Javoudan. The town folk eventually turned this tragedy into a folk tale to warn children from entering the forest. Years later, the story inspired a novel, The Beast of Javoudan, in which the wolf was actually a human who could transform. The novel followed Jean Chastel, a real hunter who had finally stopped the attacks after killing the wolf with, you guessed it, a silver bullet. Since then, the werewolf has exploded into mainstream pop culture and especially fantasy, even evolving into a romantic ideal. Thanks in part to the Twilight series, that Jacob is so dreamy. Fantasy owes a ton to folklore. Without these stories, a lot of common tropes in fantasy wouldn't exist. There's no better example of this than the dragon. Isn't it crazy that nearly every culture has some sort of example of a dragon in its early history? The leading theory is that the dragon is a combination of early man's greatest threats. Big cats, raptor birds, and snakes. Mix these up in a pot, bring to a simmer, and you get the perfect caveman murder machine, aka a dragon. Dragons showed up in early religious texts as personifications of evil. Popular art for the time would depict saints like St. George battling dragons as a religious act. These stories would eventually evolve into the trope of dragons as gold-obsessed treasure hoarders. After all, greed is one of the seven deadly sins, and dragons are the religious representation of that. After a few centuries of dragons being shish kebabs for the saints, the dragon as a concept would see a much kinder turn in 1898 in The Reluctant Dragon by Kenneth Graham, which featured an uncharacteristically friendly dragon. Sure, it may have been a child's book, but it was still a major step in viewing dragons in a different way. And without it, we wouldn't have gotten our first representation of a modern-day dragon in fantasy. Forty years after The Reluctant Dragon's release, Tolkien released The Hobbit. Smog immediately jumped off the page as a dragon with a real character. Intelligent, threatening, well-defined. Since then, books like Aragon, the first book in the Inheritance Cycle series by Christopher Paolini, have seen an even further evolution of dragons. In the book, a young farmer boy finds a dragon egg and raises the young dragon that hatches out of it. Their bond becomes extremely deep, and they ultimately work together to avenge the death of the boy's uncle. This evolution points to the flexibility of folklore concepts and their impact on the genre as a whole. The monsters of ancient stories, whether they be dragons or werewolves, tend to spread through a culture rapidly, all while changing and evolving based on the storyteller. It's a sort of storytelling shortcut. Literary historian Catherine Hume put it best. For supernatural beings to be effective in stories, they must be part of a tradition the audience knows, and to which it is conditioned to respond. There's no reason for an author to have to explain what a dragon is, because the audience already has the understanding of a dragon as a concept in literature. And this is the beauty of folklore. Fantasy owes a lot to it, and without it, a lot of common fantasy tropes that we know and love would have died out with the original storytellers. 
leaving us free of sexy werewolves or smart dragons who owe their existence to the folktales that came before. Fantasy, even as it evolves, is timeless because it has its roots in folklore and fairy tales. This is why we see so many retellings time and time again. Authors like C.J. Redwine with the Raven Spire series, Megan Spooner with The Hunted in Sherwood, and Marissa Meyer with The Lunar Chronicles all retell classic fairy tales. A modern approach to a classic story like Hunted, which retells Beauty and the Beast in a modern setting, or alternative perspectives and backstory like The Queen of Hearts in Heartless, all add new twists on old classics. These types of books bring new readers to stories that used to be told around campfires and re-examines them through new lenses. And this simply wouldn't be possible without folklore and its rich history. Without it, we would miss out on timeless lessons, epic adventures, and new perspectives. And that would be a major storytelling shame. Thanks so much for watching. Let us know in the comments below what your favorite examples of folklore and fantasy books are. The Witcher is chocked full of folklore.